30 minutes after the hour, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the CORE Canada webinar, Aging Lives Uprooted, Welcoming and Supporting Older Refugees to Canadian Communities. My name is Barbara McMillan, and I'm the Provincial Community Engagement Coordinator for United Way British Columbia's Healthy Aging Department, and one of the team involved with CORE Canada, the Pan-Canadian Healthy Aging Knowledge Hub. Thank you for joining us today, and I know that you share with me in humbly acknowledging the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Indigenous peoples in this place we now call Canada, and an honouring and expressing gratitude to the many territorial keepers of the lands on which we work, live, play, and gather. There's over 100 people registered for the session. I'm not sure that all of them will turn up, but to help things run smoothly, everyone except the presenters will remain muted with cameras off. However, we'd love to know who you are and where you're joining from, so please introduce yourself in the chat box. There will be an opportunity for some questions towards the end of the session. Please use the quick Q&A feature and note who you're directing your question to. This session is being recorded and will be posted on CORE Canada, so make sure to sign up for the CORE e-news to hear about this and other recorded webinars that are really valuable resources on healthy aging topics. Today's session offers closed captioning and French translation, and we'll post these detailed instructions in the chat box, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, and if you're having any difficulties with either of these, let us know in the chat box and Gemma will try to help you out. But basically for French in your meeting or your webinar controls, click interpretation and then click for French. For closed captioning, click the show captions button and select English. And now I'm very pleased to introduce Gregor Stenton, the Executive Director of HealthAge Canada, who will be your moderator for this session. Thank you, Barb, and welcome everyone. It's uh, just a thrill to be here. I'm so uh, glad to have this opportunity to be with you all and for this exciting event today that uh, long in coming, and we we have already feel, uh, wow, as we put together our panelists and our topics, we really need a, a longer session and, and more in-depth, but really excited to welcome some excellent uh, panelists here today for our conversation and uh, looking forward to our time together. I'd like to introduce you to uh, Sue Hezjazal, who's uh, with OACAO, the executive director, who's going to uh, introduce our day, tell you a little bit about how we got here, and uh, is going to share a video with us. Over to you, Sue. Thank you very much, Gregor. It's truly my pleasure to be with you today and to be part of this amazing planning committee for this very important event. We're thrilled to be partnering with Help Age Canada, Core Canada, United Way BC, and um, this is a capacity building event that's part of the OACAO's annual offerings uh, with funding made possible with funding from the Government of Ontario. The OACAO is a nonprofit charitable organization representing a network of over 230 not for profit and municipal centers and organizations in Ontario. We're the voice of older adult centers and seniors active living centers. This event was a little brainchild of mine that was inspired by the OACIO, OACAO's desire to support and connect older adult refugees to the wonderful community assets that are senior centers. We surveyed our members in the fall of 2022 to find out if and how they were supporting and reaching diverse seniors. The results were encouraging with around half indicating that they were hosting immigrant, refugee, and newcomer older adults to their centers. This included 14% who served Ukrainian seniors and 11% who served undocumented seniors. Some centers serve specific ethnocultural communities, while others host social and recreational programs in multiple languages. Our centers called for more training and resources to create more inclusive environments and to better meet the needs of these communities, citing the need for increased community awareness and sensitivity training strategies and opportunities to develop new partnerships with immigrant and newcomer service agencies, among other things. Hence was born the desire to work with this fabulous team and offer this wonderful webinar. One center that is a rising star in our sector and in our network is the Rexdale Community Health Center, who is also um, Ministry for Seniors and Accessibility funded as a Seniors Active Living Center. Their inclusive and equity-based model is an exceptional resource for marginalized seniors in Toronto. They've recently launched their Voices of Di Diversity documentary series, which is funded through the New Horizons for Seniors program, Government of Canada. 
highlighting their lived experience of eight immigrant seniors. We have the pleasure of sharing a short trailer for their project now. And then I'll, I'll include some information in the chat box because they're inviting all of you to join them for part two of their documentary series this Friday, um, March 24th at 10.45 a.m. Eastern time. Again, it's called Voices of Diversity. And I'll ask my colleague, Lena, to cue that up. And I do thank our friends from Rexdale Community Health Center, Wendy, Dan, Chris, Allison, Ritz, and the amazing senior stars for allowing us to share a little snippet of their stories today. Hi, my name is Sheila. I'm a member of the Seniors Program at Rexdale Community Center. And today I'm going to tell you my story. Coming to Canada was a blessing to us. So my husband, he said, I think we should go to Canada. So, but I saw those mountains of uh, snow. I said, how could that be? <laughs> In those days, streetcar tickets were four for a dollar. And daily I would go downtown looking for jobs. I was born in Uganda in March 1936. And a couple of people in my village died in one of the ships that were torpedoed. My mother also sacrificed the Lord. Entonces tuve que viajar en un camión con ella, agarradas en la parte de atrás. And some people were shocked. How you could move your horse? I said, well, it was wood. And being from India, and you have a daughter, and somebody asked to get them married, get them married. We have no say, but now, I will never say that to anybody at that age. My name is Esther Oyewumu. I'm a Nigerian by birth, but now I'm a Canadian. Thank you, Sue. That's a fantastic video. Uh, again, uh, we'll put that in the chat. The Voices of Diversity trailer is there. Please do have a look and join on Friday to see the launch of the other full-length um, uh, uh, Voices of Diversity. Fantastic. Well, on our agenda today, we have a number of great speakers. Um, and I am going to kick things off here with a little bit of a discussion, or a presentation, rather, on older people in conflict zones or you know what is it that uh, many of our refugee uh, older refugees are coming from so i'm just going to queue up my my uh, presentation here Help Age Canada, for those of you who don't know, we, we support community-based initiatives through our partnerships locally and abroad to improve the lives of older persons and their communities. We develop innovative pro projects and lead network-wide collaborations to create a world for which all age with dignity. So, you know, we, we live in a fragmented and unfortunately a, uh, a challenging world where in Canada, we don't often see what many, many people are facing around the world. And sadly, we are facing an increase in the need for humanitarian and development work all over the world. We have global fuel, food, fuel, and a finance crisis, the worst hunger crisis in 50 years in the Horn of Africa, potentially one of the worst humanitarian uh, disasters the world has ever seen as well as climate change, contributing to humanitarian crisis worldwide with climate-related disasters driving increased risks, levels of risk and vulnerability. 2023 set a record for humanitarian relief requirements with 339 million people in need of assistance in 69 countries, an increase of 65 million people compared to the same time last year. And uh, there's been an increase, a call from the United Nations for a 25% increase compared to 2022 for the amount of humanitarian response required from first world countries. And in 2022, e even with such an increase, uh, only 41% of required humanitarian funding was received. 
you know, the other issue is, is that we are getting older. By 2050, 22% uh, of the total world population will be uh, over the age of 60. That's a, a huge increase over a very short period of time. As we all know, people are, are living longer. Uh, there's a lot of good news in that story, but it also means that it's uh, the, the fastest growing and largest demographic in the whole world. And older people are especially vulnerable to national disasters, conflict, long-term crisis like droughts, food shortages, et cetera. And with this demographic change and population aging means that older people will become more and more uh, often the largest affected group in humanitarian crisis worldwide. And today, older people's vulnerability in emergencies is still not recognized. Our work with HelpAge Canada and HelpAge International, we are always advocating for the needs of older people in humanitarian and development crises around the world who are always, always overlooked. There's all kinds of effects that people are facing in refugee camps and in various locations before they come to Canada all over the world. Uh, in many cases, it is younger people that end up leaving, uh, leaving them behind. Um, they can't leave, or in some cases, they don't want to leave. Um, there is all kinds of abuse, uh, need for protection, uh, access to services, medication, uh, eviction threats, um, uh, violence perpetrated against them. It's very similar to uh, child protection and the needs to have um, uh, protection for older people and accessibility. Uh, often we work uh, for older people and people with special needs and disabilities. An example uh, in the Syrian crisis, 30% uh, of refugees in Jordan and Lebanon have very specific needs. One in five refugees is affected by physical, sensory, or intellectual impairment. One in, one in seven is affected by chronic disease or non-communicable diseases. One in 20 suffers from injury, and nearly 80% of those injuries directly resulting from the conflict itself. And 77% of older refugees are affected by impairment, injury, or chronic disease. I'll move a little bit quickly through these slides for the sake of time. But, you know, to also note that, that every person is, of course, an individual. You know, we can't really um, speak about all refugees, certainly, and certainly not all older refugees is the same. Everyone comes from a different place, has their own, um, their own story, their own particular and unique needs that we need to be responding to. So, you know, the question really is, in many cases, are, are we ready for, for what is to come? Um, older people continue, constitute a growing proportion of the older population in developing and developed countries. Older people constitute a growing number of those affected by humanitarian crises. And humanitarian crises are increasing and displacing more people. Canada will be welcoming more refugees for the foreseeable future. And are we uh, ready to welcome them? And every person, as I mentioned, is, is, is an individual. They're coming from a varied background. Um, but often there is one thing that they are that they're seeking. And I'd like to share now uh, um, a video that we from a recent trip that I had to um, uh, Ukraine. We have a large uh, program in Ukraine as well as Ethiopia, but this particular piece comes from, um, I'm just gonna reshare so I can get the video working on it. This is a short piece uh, of the conflict in Ukraine.
Ми схопили своїх дітей, я була у доньки, в неї двоє малих дітей. Схопили дітей на машину і їхали, усі їхали на захід. Була, була пробки такі були, дуже багато людей їхали на захід. Я із Донецька. Моє життя змінилося з 2014 року, бо мені прийшлося виїхати до Оріхова. Ливен жила Запорізька область Оріхів. Але okay. там зараз немає right Україна, моя Люба, Донецька область, місто Костянтинівка. Як зібрала чимоден з вечора на автопілоті. Я не розуміла взагалі, що про я, куди я їду. Але я хотіла подалі від цього життя виїхати. Поїхати. Ми у 14-му році переїхали до Ізюму, Ізюмський район, в мешкавому селі, а потім це нас було можливість виїхати, я поїхала сюди, бо... Один понеділок жіночки співають. Ой, радуйся, земле, син Божий, народився. Потім нам дають щось там малювати, книжки якісь обмінюються. Тобто вам фітнес. Коли ти хочеш спілкуватися, то ти взагалі знайдеш людей, з якими будеш спілкуватися, і тобі не буде скучно. Занимаємося. Тут кожен день у нас і якісь художні, там, ось розмальовки, там, різна діяльність. І музична, і фізична. Різна. Буває чаювання тут. Тут я в центрі змогла себе реалізувати. Хотілося б, щоб закінчилась війна і ми повернулися додому. Але ж це не вдома. Це не вдома. Це не вдома. Це програма, які комуніті сейф спеці зараз в Україні, яку я мав привілегію відвідувати, яка була фондована від Global Affairs Canada. Um, which we're really proud of and look forward to continuing that through this uh, this coming year. So I hope that was a little snapshot of, uh, of, of what maybe is happening in the world and some of the affects of, of older people. And um, I'd like now to, to move on with our, our program. And it's my uh, privilege to introduce to you Iris Chalner of Mosaic. I, Iris is over the past 10 years, she has led the private sponsorship, resettlement and successful integration of hundreds of refugees from all over the world into Canada and currently serving as the private sponsorship of refugees program manager at Mosaic, one of the largest settlement organizations in Canada. And she is one of the leaders of Operation Not For, hashtag Not Forgotten, an innovative partnership between Mosaic, Adds Up Canada, UNHCR and the Refugee Council of Australia. Over to you, Iris. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really uh, glad to be here and to talk to you about some of the challenges that um, privately sponsored um, newcomers that are a little older are facing and the challenges that are unique to them. Um, as you can imagine, when you're coming from a refugee background, some of the challenges that are faced by older immigrants are certainly amplified by a refugee experience and very much informed by how long your refugee experience was. Um, when people are sponsoring refugees to Canada, they do often out of the most lovely intention, and many of them are sponsored by family members across Canada. And 
So you know, we see many people sponsoring their parents or grandparents. Of course, that leads to an empowering balance when people arrive in Canada. That means their sponsors know how Canada works. They speak the language. They know all the things you don't know. And often when you are a little older, that is a difficult thing to experience, to have your children explain things to you, to rely on them to translate for you. They are now the power and the knowledge holders. That can be extremely difficult and it can certainly last a lifetime. Language is a huge component for people when they come to Canada and your ability to read and your ability to speak English is extremely amplified at that stage. I wanna give you an example. A couple of years ago, we helped settle um, a family and um, one of them was the matriarch of the family. She was 70 years old. Her name was Fatima. And Fatima had never gone to school. Fatima had virtually no English. She could say hi and goodbye. And had never been able to gain education outside her home. And when she came to Canada, every meeting I was at, Fatima always came up to me and smiled and her daughter would come and translate for her. And then finally, about a year later, uh, maybe a little less than a year, Fatima comes up to me with her daughter and Fatima says to me, I can say my address without her daughter saying a word. And she repeated her address to me. And I don't know if you know what that meant for her, because now Fatima was able to take the SkyTrain and the bus everywhere she wanted to go, because now she could ask somebody for help to get back home. This gave her huge agency over herself. That small thing of being able to say your address made all the difference in her quality of life. Now Fatima was going places, joining other seniors, going sightseeing, going with her grandchildren places. And a few months later, she sends me a picture of her signature and it said, I can sign my name. And that still makes me cry because before she would sign with the thumbprint or an X. And for her to continue English class, for her to continue to grow was a huge, huge step. Because we know, we know the older you get, the harder it is to learn. And we know that we face challenges as we get older. But to amplify those when you are a newcomer in all the challenges that come with being a newcomer at the same time. So we need to be aware of these very small steps that mean so, so much in having that self-agency. I looked up some statistics and it's from vital statistics. And in 2017, about 20% of the resettled refugees were over the age of 45, just for 2017. So that's a significant number, but the programming for older refugees, for older previous refugees, because after all, they are permanent residents upon arrival in Canada and qualify for all the programs permanent residents qualify for. But 20% is a significant number. And we certainly don't see the amount of uh, programming geared to older um, newcomers with a refugee background that would certainly better assist them to settle in the community. So opportunities for community, for being able to share with people of a like background of refugee experiences are important to people. We know that access to old age security 
is restricted because they don't haven't been 10 years in Canada and they might be of a pensionable age. So access to financial support long term is not there. And often that creates this perpetual wheel of poverty for older refugee arrivals. So it's really important that we continue to be more aware and continue to um, advocate for older arrivals and the needs that they have and the um, sense of community and support and build on the resources that are already there, such as giving people the opportunity to uh, join in, um, in community support that is already there for seniors across Canada. So making connections between senior centers and needs. Arrivals with a refugee background are extremely important for people to feel a sense of connection, for empowering older newcomer arrivals in participating in Canadian society. It is important that those older Canadians welcome those newcomers and become part of their settlement support in Canada. This is what makes a difference. This is what, what inspires us and what Canada is good at. We're good at welcoming newcomers. Are we so good at really inviting them into our homes and, and into our communities and making effective connections? Sometimes not so, because we tend to be just polite and not invite people over. So inviting them into those existing programs that are there and making space in the existing programs within our communities is vitally important. So for me, the strengthening between settlement organizations that are providing support to newcomers, to groups that are providing uh, settlement support or private sponsorship that is vitally important that people are invited in because it's difficult to knock on the door when you're not sure about the language, when you are constantly experiencing culture shock. It's really, really difficult. So it becomes that it is more important to invite people in, to open those doors wide and to have opportunities for meeting, for uh, traditions, for sharing. Um, I think we are more aware with reconciliation efforts about the importance of sharing experiences in where we come from. And I hope that continues to build um, and continues uh, to make a difference for those older newcomers into Canada. So um, I think that's kind of what I want to say. I want to inspire all of us to continue to open doors where we don't see them wide open to all the newcomers. It's important that we do so. And be it a choir, be it a dinner, be it uh, an event where we consciously invite um, older newcomers to join us is really, really important. Thank you very much, Iris. Uh, very uh, um, a moving and a very uh, a practical response, I think, is something we all need to be uh, keeping in mind, regardless of, of where we are, just um, where we are right in, the, in our own neighborhoods, in our own communities. Thank you for that. Well, it's uh, my, my privilege now to invite uh, Kahir Lalji, uh, Provincial Director in Government Relations and Programs, United Way of BC. He's going to share a little bit of information with us or ideas about uh, the refugee experience in Canada over the last uh, 50 years. Uh, over to you, Kahir. Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Gregor, and, and for my co-panelists uh, on, the, on the call today. 
Uh, first of all, uh, for those of you on the in the meeting that are celebrating Navroz with me, I wish you all a happy Navroz and a happy new year. And I hope that you get some time to spend with your family and loved ones to reflect um, over the upcoming year. So happy Navroz to everybody on the call that's celebrating with, with me today. Look, you know, some, some reflections that I'll share today won't be new, rather reflections and observations of some of our experiences um, across the country in welcoming newcomers or displaced peoples. Um, and while we know that it's not uncommon for Canada to open its doors over the last century or, or century and a half, we're really gonna hone in on a few examples um, over the last half century or so. But I do wanna echo something that was said um, at the outset, that every newcomer or every refugee's experience is different. We cannot homogenize a particular community. We cannot even homogenize a particular family. One's experience is based on their ethnicity, their culture, their political affiliation, their sexual identity, their religious beliefs. And so it's very important that as we prepare um, to, to welcome newcomers or, or displaced peoples, that we take a person-centered approach um, in the delivery of support programs uh, and services. That being said, <laughs> what we have seen uh, through some of the examples which I'll share with you are some common trends that have come up um, for consideration. And one is the sense of community, the sense of belonging, a sense of connectedness. And we know that this is important across the lifespan, <laughs> but it becomes increasingly instrumental and paramount for newcomers who are older uh, to be able to have some social capital um, as they settle or resettle in their new home. If you look at, for example, the South Asian diaspora that immigrated from East Africa in the uh, late 70s, what was a critical success factor to their immigration was a small community that had already established themselves here in Canada. To be able to connect through familiar food, through familiar culture, through familiar languages was so paramount uh, in supporting and integrating uh, the South Asian diaspora that came into Canada in the 1970s. As we've worked with this cohort over the last 50 years or so, we've had some interesting observations. The first observation is that this diaspora birthed first generation Canadians. And as a result, we've seen cultural squeezes that have emerged over the last 50 years uh, that provides a really nuanced context in how to support intergenerational um, families and cohorts uh, who have had years of um, settlement in their home or host country. Those that have immigrated 30, 40, 50 years ago, have also been able to accumulate life experience in Canada. They've been able to enhance, in certain regards, vocational skills. And what we've seen is that those that have come earlier play an instrumental role in supporting those that arrived later to share their experiences, share their culture, share their um, support. Um, and that development of that social support system has been um, paramount in the resettlement. And we saw this as well in the late 90s and the early 2000s uh, when Canada welcomed um, uh, people from Central Asia, primarily Afghanistan. And what we saw during this time was the impact of the political, economical, and cultural strife that people were facing in their home countries. And when we welcomed folks to, to, to Canada, we saw um, emotional vulnerability, emotional instability, emotional volatility um, that really impacted integration and settlement and resettlement into their new country. We also saw that because of their, um, their country of origin, lifespans were different. Um, so, you know, people were, the average age of life was, was potentially uh, different than, than that of Canada. 
And the baseline and definition of hardship was also different. So what we may consider an unacceptable quality of life is very different than what newcomers uh, or those experiencing um, a displacement um, have, have experienced. And so to really understand that baseline perspective of hardship was really important in our learnings. But we, what we also found though, was the role of local community, the role of local support was instrumental um, in the um, settlement and the adjustments of newcomers and displaced peoples. We also saw this um, in 2015 and 2016 when we welcomed Syrian refugees, uh, as well as recently in 2021 uh, when we uh, were welcoming displaced Ukrainians. Um, and so while some of the um, experiences of, the, of, of their of journeys were shared similar characteristics, we saw some interesting trends in the mobilization of, of support over the last five to seven years. One was the impact of the digital world and digital poverty and, the, and digital illiteracy um, that needed to be um, addressed. We saw um, an increased diversity in lived experience where there was a risk of homogenizing uh, groups of people that are coming, uh, coming over. We've seen the rise of um, racism and the clash of ignorance that prevails in community. And we've also seen the rise of socio-political and economical pressures on the host country. So for example, we already know for Canada has a housing crisis, a health systems crisis. And so those pressures um, provide additional nuances on the host country um, of which very often local communities and community-based organizations step up uh, to address. And so as we reflect over some um, examples of, of waves of, of migration of displaced peoples over the last half century or so, I encourage us to keep in mind the importance of social capital, of the sense of belonging, the role the community can play, but also paying homage to the individual life experiences and assets that come along with, the, uh, with that journey. I also just want to end here by acknowledging and paying homage to the thousands of community-based organizations across the country uh, that are providing services day in and, and day out. And, and let's not forget uh, some of the um, impact uh, this work has on our frontline workers as well um, as we're welcoming um, newcomers and displaced peoples uh, into, uh, into Canada. It's an exciting opportunity to continue to open our doors uh, but we need to be particularly intentional um, in, in the work that we're doing. And so I'll leave it at, at that, Gregor, and hand, hand the floor back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Kahir. Thank you for such an excellent overview and, uh, and, a, and a generous uh, reminder of our need to uh, be mindful of all of those uh, frontline workers across the country who are, who are engaged in this uh, very critical, important, and sensitive work. Well, it's my uh, uh, pleasure now to introduce uh, Venke Gostdal. Uh, Venke is the Director of Programs, Settlements, and Integration Services at Immigrant Services Association of Nova Scotia. Uh, she holds a Master in Social Work and has, has over 10 years' experience in leadership roles at ISANS. And Venke has been active on com committees and initiatives related to refugee settlement, including the current appointment to the National RAP Working Group and the resettlement of Afghan and Ukrainian refugees. Uh, welcome, Venke. Thank you very much. I'm just realizing I have to get to the beginning of my presentation, and I mostly have presentation to keep me on track. So okay. I'm glad if you give me a little bit notice if I'm getting towards. Sure uh, thing. I need to speed up and I realize as well with our interpreters I will try to uh, keep the pace uh, slower so it's able to um, interpret. So um, just briefly just uh, and again thank you so much for in inviting me and I'm very excited to be able to um, both share what we are thinking and doing in Halifax and what we are learning there but also to hear about what's ha happening across Canada on this very important topic. Um, so ISENS uh, is, a, is a settlement agency um, that have been around for about 42 years or so with 
uh, actually the starting point for us was the resettlement of refugees. So that had always been our core work for, for all these years. And our mission, vision and mission is a community where all can belong and grow and helping immigrants build a future in Nova Scotia. And that is again, an extremely um, important related to this discussion as well, that, that is, it is for everybody, including our elders, our immigrant elder, el elders. Um, just, I don't want to get into very much about uh, ISNES, but just to let you, let you know that our organization is a multi-service agency is providing services to uh, newcomers to Canada and, um, and, and focusing in Nova Scotia. So it is from pre-arrival to settlement and resettlement language and employment and all of that. So when I'm going to be talking about this, it is based on the learning that we have had with um, uh, 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 older refugees and, and others that, um, that we will be talking about. Uh, when I was asked to, to come and speak, I was thinking about um, all the different work that we have done over the last 15 years or so or more around making sure that the needs and um, the opportunities of our um, older refugees are, are met. And so we actually did a project in 2018 and unfortunately in many ways, not much have changed. So I used some of the, what I'm preparing today was what we learned from that research project. So this was about looking at the needs and the contribution of immigrant and refugees populations age 50 and above and who are settling in Nova Scotia and I particularly today are thinking about the refugee population. And what we really were hoping with this is to be able to learn and also look at our own programming, but also help us to have conversations with other organizations in the community about how to further um, uh, meet the needs. And so um, I would really like to start um, to talk about the contributions. So while there is um, a lot of uh, uh, experiences of trauma and other things that and a lot of loss that people are going through, we also what we have found initially, but we really feel also is it's um, it helps us to do our work is to look for the, look at the contribution uh, of our refugees. And so what we find is that while mo most of our families come in multi-generational families, so we have the, the older um, uh, uh, parents and then uh, adult, child uh, adult children and their children often come. Uh, and what we found is that they provide uh, a lot of support to the family, often taking care of uh, the children and also support in cooking and other things that is related. So they contribute very much to the family and also that they are also the ones in the family that, that brings the tradition and the language and making sure that the, the, uh, the small ones are learning about the culture and the history of where they came from and that. And, and also pro as elders have ad advice and, and and a wisdom that is good for the whole family and also for the community as well. And also we found when we were uh, doing this little project that we also found many people are in, uh, in actively volunteering in their own maybe ethnic or religious communities or actually it uh, depends again on um, on their interests and their opportunities of volunteering in the larger community. And also some of them are, are, are also looking for, for, for different type of work and are working. So in different ways, I just want to say that um, it was, it's very enriching when you're starting to listen to, to all the different contributions that they have and that uh, they, they, it's really important to, for them to have a sense of, um, a sense of purpose and as you said like they, they need to have a sense that they are that there's a, that they have an important job to do and and um so uh and i just put quotes on the side from that research uh uh so just to hear to see what um what they were talking about um on the challenges now is from both from, from a personal or from a family context is that as you earlier talked about the, the experiences before they came to Canada. And of course, that can be very different and have different effect on them and their family and also their health and their family circumstances. So all of those things as already been talked about have a big impact on the personal experience or the experiences of that family. And so as we look at how to support them moving forward, we need to both look at the individual needs of the the elders, but also 
uh, the needs of the family as a whole, because often it is all intermixed. Um, so that's just, just another one. Uh, and of course, the earlier conversation on culture shock and also learning a, a new language um, is a huge um, barrier. Um, the isolation is, is very difficult. Like often you will have the um, adult children uh, working or children go to school. So they often, if they're not connected to others, they can be very isolated at home and feeling, um, and feeling uh, you know, that, that um, feeling alone and they actually have too much time to think about everything that the experiences. And, and um, so it, it's a very important to, to, to break that. Um, also, they they had a, a certain status, they had a certain identity before they came, and all of that is changed now when they are coming to their new country, and they need to, uh, as, as well as the rest of their family, trying to um, build a sense of identity and, and, and their authority in the family, because they're suddenly shift, changing because of language and all the other things that was talked about in the earlier presentations. And also um, another thing that we also have found is it really impacting the, um, the elders is also the overall settlement and integration of the whole family. So you can have a family that in generally everything is going fairly well or on the, on the spectrum things that are, you know, they're settling in fairly well and smoothly, or you have a family that have a lot of issues uh, that in terms and, 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 and barriers to uh, settlement and that will affect uh, everybody, including the elders, and if they feel they don't have have an opportunity or are able to support in that, it also can be very, very uh, stressful. Um, so again, that's something to think think about it. Again, I'm thinking about uh, as people are serving them um, in the community to keep in mind. So stepping systemic challenges. Um, it's also what we found is the majority of the people we were talking about, and we also see that in our gen daily work is finances is a big issue for most families. Um, and, you know, because, you know, the housing crisis was mentioned, like the cost of, of living is expensive. And with that, the less money you have, the less you, you have to act to to use on other things uh, that create quality in your life. So um, again, it, is, it becomes, uh, and also uh, what is being prioritized in the family. And, and it also even could come down to, do you have the, the money for the medication that you need and, and, and what do you cut out to meet, uh, meet needs? Language barriers, as we talked about earlier, is a huge uh, issue and not just the book in their social life, but also to access services um, and, uh, you know, while we still have come far over the years in terms of having interpreters in the different services in the community, they're still lacking and it's still a barrier to be able to be able to communicate on their needs and have access to the information and supports that is required. And that also ties into the uh, information, in inaccessible information and um, difficulty in understanding processes or systems so, for example, if they have a health condition and your stats around 70 some percent is a very radar and that's what we have been seeing here as well, like the, the generally the elder they are, the more and more chronic illnesses we see and then the more they need to access services in the community and if you don't have information and and not uh, support in in uh, navigating all of that it becomes very challenging and if you add to a family that maybe are themselves settling in, it becomes can be pretty overwhelming uh, for for them. Um, so so the 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 um, so generally to find services um, and and programs that are that are set up to meet their needs and understand the refugee or immigrant experience, um, it, it, it's a, it can be a struggle, and that is something as you know, our organization is working with, with working with partners in the community to always enhance and try to um, uh, uh, improve those uh, referrals and those uh, service experiences. Um, so around programs and support challenges. Um, so uh, 
for example, government assisted refugees or privately sponsored refugees that was mentioned, they, they would have an intense um, service uh, support for the first year or so. And then after that, it will be, they are, they are eligible for settlement services until they have citizenship uh, usually. And so over time, there's their access to direct and more um, uh, uh, focused services may be uh, reduced over time. And that can be a barrier for them over time. They will still often need um, uh, services or access and navigation to, with health care or with, with other programs in the community. Um, and, uh, and just as I said earlier about uh, access to cultural relevant programs is, is particular. Um, we are seeing that in Nova Scotia and, and they're probably the same issue in other provinces. Transportation as well is, is an issue. Um, we have a, a system here where we have buses and all. If you need um, a special transportation um, you know, for, mo for mo mobility, um, it can be waiting lists and challenges to book your appointments. And then you also need to communicate in English to be able to reserve those, those, um, those buses. So I'm just saying like, again, if you have a language barrier and a busy family to support you, it, 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 it can be um, additional strain, strain uh, around that. Um, so, um, and uh, changes to care and need and lack of social. So the, the other thing is that over time, we also see people's um, need for services also changes and um, the, the lack, and, and there is often gradually more and more lack of, of social engagement, but when their, their health deteriorates. So again, to try to figure out alternative ways to support them uh, in accessing and being around people and getting the care they need. Thank Overall, you, maybe another it, couple of minutes. Okay, good. Yeah. I just generally, a lot of the recommendations that came out of here was generally to make sure that services are accessible, both from, both from a mobility and language and cultural way, and that, um, that they, they are um, inclusive of immigrant and refugees. In, in places like Halifax, we maybe, don't, we maybe rarely have a program just for one ethnic community. So we more looking at trying to make sure that services in the community are reflective and understanding um, immigrant and refugee uh, experiences. So it's important that, that um, those things are co uh, um, considerate. Uh, we also looking at, we really heard very clearly that uh, elderly, uh, the elders want to really think, uh, uh, have intergenerational programs and services, and that also, and also housing options. So again, the, the, of course, there are, they want individual attention and supports, but also they want to have their family or their grandchildren inclusive, included in the services and making sure that they have housing where all of them can, can live together, you know, uh, so um, and also to have a very tailored and close uh, case management support um, over an extended period of time to respond to the needs that they have. And, is, and mental health support, and that's not in the North American individual one-on-one -on -one support necessary, but really looking at how you're learning um, about uh, how to support yourself and looking at mental health more from a global perspective and including the practices and the the, 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 you know, the perspectives from, from where they're from. And, um, and just maybe I can just rate, jump down to the bottom there is, for us in Nova Scotia, it has very, been very important to partner to, with mainstream uh, agencies or health providers and, and to work with them to try to, to build um, opportunities and, 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 and services that are inclusive of newcomers because we as a settlement agencies cannot do it all and we tend to having to focus on 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 the first four or five years of people's uh, stay in how uh, stay in, in in Nova Scotia. I just wanted to quickly just show you some of the things that we have done uh, at, in, in in our agency so we are we have focused on a program called immigrant aging well after the learnings from this project which is about 
um, information and support to to um, to uh, immigrant elders and refugees elders who who about services for the aging population and also the support for their families as well, so they are better suited and supported in accessing the services in the community. And then you can see we have we have uh, also spe special language classes and programs for the elderly populations. Um, with it, with the understanding that many times they will learn, uh, they will need it. They have a different pace of learning the language and that. Um, I'm probably run out of time. Is it? I, I think we're fairly close. And maybe you could just uh, wrap up uh, with your last yeah. slide. Or... Yeah. yeah. So I, I think it was very interesting to hear uh, the discussion from Mosaic in uh, coming from Vancouver and the larger size. So I think my perspective is maybe from uh, Halifax being a little bit of a smaller city and where we need to really be closely at, at work with um, organizations in the community. And we, we really try to um, build and, and together partner to build an, um, services in the community. And it's really important that uh, you know to work with the settlement agencies to, to, and, and get the support if you want but definitely uh, because we maybe know where the, where and how to access the immigrant and refugee populations and we will gladly connect with you to work together to 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 make um, those referrals because if not they will be very isolated you know, on their long journey in Canada. Yeah. Thank, Thank you Venke. What a what a, an, an amazing suite of services uh, you offer and the experience of of journeying so closely and adapting your programs to the needs uh, very contextual excellent I wonder if we might have and I, I think we can send it out to participants but a copy of that report I think could be quite interesting uh, to, to people so thank you so much for for sharing that. Uh, it's my pleasure now. We we now are uh, have with us two uh, refugees, two older refugees who um, are here to uh, share a, a little bit. Uh, Aziz and Khalid. Uh, Aziz is uh, 59 years old and was uh, held by Australia in indefinite immigration detention in Papua New Guinea for nearly 10 years and is sponsored by Mosaic as part of Operation Not Forgotten. He arrived in Vancouver in January of this year, and yet his wife and six children remain in Afghanistan. Uh, Khalid, who's going to help with uh, uh, as well some of the translation, uh, is, is from Iran and uh, was also held on Nauru Island. Um, so uh, welcome to you both, Salam alaikum. Welcome to our program today. Good morning, everybody. I hope you're doing well, and thanks for opportunity to to have us. And I hope we can have a good session today. Thank you very much. Well, I thought we would, uh, you know, we would take, um, you know, uh, there'll be opportunity for questions later, but we can take, you know, ten or fifteen minutes now to maybe ask you a few questions. And and I thought, you know, what might be of most interest is to for our in our case is to talk a little bit about the experience of of coming arriving and being settled in Canada and you know what are some of the helps and what are some of the hinders you know what have you really valued and appreciated and, and stood out for you as you go through this remarkable um transition and what maybe has been um a challenge or what obstacles have you found that maybe we may as in canada that we could be facilitating a little uh better for you because we want you to know that we know that canada is a better canada because you're here and Thanks. we we want to make that uh, this your home uh, and that's why we're here so maybe you could uh, tell us a little bit about that what what has helped and what maybe has hindered so i'm going to translate for you میگم وقتی که رسیدی کانادا چه مشکلاتی دیدی و چه اتفاقات خوبی دیدی که رسیدی خب یعنی چه کمک‌هایی دیدی و چه اتفاقاتی که مثلا انتظار داشتی بود چون ما می‌خوایم این کانادا رو یه کانادای کنیم بهتر از این بشه خاطری که شما ها اینجا هستید ما کمک کنیم که این بزرگتر باشه تا از وقتی که آمدید چه موانه چه ما مشکلاتی دیدی و چه کامک ها چه خوبی ها چه کامک هایی دیدی 
اما اکه اما دو میگه خوب خوبی هایش ازی بود که برای ما این ما را استقبال کردن بسیار و خوبی ما را آوردن و بعد دوم برای ما خانه گرفتن و برای من کرای خانه و خرج خوردن و تأمین کردن میدین The first uh, things very once inspiring me, the welcoming it was in the art airport because when we are arriving that we actually surprising by the Moisek staff and how they are welcoming us. And after that, when we arriving to housing, which they are already provide everything on that, even the fridge was the full of the food, even they cook food already as, as well for us, which was really surprising us by that's welcoming. و از این مشکلات که ما اینجا دیدیم و میبینیم به خاطر که ما زبان خوب انگلیسی خوب نیست به خاطر زبان مشکل دارم دویم به خاطر کاریم که کار اینجا نداریم به کار هستیم فامیلی به پول نیاز داره اره ما باید اره این مشکلات ماست که ما به کار هستیم باید and uh, part of that will come in was the good uh, support income which we have uh, pro Moizak provide uh, for us for one year and the rent of the housing which was really we considered as a cheap should could be like a more than it should be but they are really were generous to us and they made it really like a half a price and but the problems I'm facing because I have a lack of knowledge of the English which is make it hard for me to find the jobs and I have a family in back home which I have to support them especially during these Norris days and the Ramazan is coming and they need my support but in my age it's hard to find the job it's, and especially with my English too mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. دیگه ما نیاز داریم که فامیلی از دوتر بیایی اینجا بس بچه هایم همهش وقت دست خانده نشد و دست بخوانند آره مدرسه برند آره دیگه مشکلات های اینا است دیگه که وقت ما زیادتر آرزوی زیادتر مشکل این کسی که بچه هایم دوتر بیایی و برند اینجا خود دست بخوانند در افغانستان شما میدانیم که نه مدرسه است نه دست بخوانند to get to Canada because it's very uh, actually uh, stressed me out of this because they are still living in Afghanistan and you know how the things is going in as Afghanistan as well and this this is the time for them to, to can have a better opportunity for study to have a better life so I'm really thinking about them and I'm stressed out too because the Afghanistan situation is really critical at the moment and I wish these ha things happen more faster and quicker. Down with all the same. Well, the game was killing the game, 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 uh the th other things uh health actually coverage sometimes is not helping which uh, i experienced once with him because i was with him for dental uh when i was there they didn't accept to cover some of his uh teeth problem which is really annoying him too i, I mean not the way they answer him but because he has this health issue for a long time and he wish he had opportunity to fix these things but it's really annoying him because they didn't accept that. And now sometimes he has to wait such a long time for to get the appointment, even for op uh, optometry too as well. Which, as I said that time, even to uh, my good coordinates here, maybe they should consider him as his age because he's a senior. Why they should put him through like a normal people? Maybe because he has a sore eye and Really, sometimes he's really facing these problems too. That will be all. I'm, he has nothing further to say. Yeah. What about, uh, if I may, um, how has he, has it been accessible connecting with uh, other people from his community? Other uh, Has there been an opportunity to connect with other Af the Afghan community in town? Is that something? Um, 
میگه چطور تا حالا تو مسی با همشهریات افغانی ها ارتباط برقرار کنی برات ساده بوده یا سخت بوده بله اینا را ما ارتباط برقرار کردیم ولی تا یک بار سخت بود پیدا کردنشم برام سخت بود پیدا کردیم رفتیم بالاخره اینجا کسی که ما بشناسم کسی نبود هیچ کس دوستای ما هست نبود هیچ هیچ کس برای تو بتره Of course, so it was really hard to get to first know that communicate, uh, com- actually community. It was really, it was hard for him in that place. But only once they gathering and he went there, but still he didn't get any help and he didn't know, he he has known any of them. And so it wasn't really useful. It wasn't useful for him at all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And maybe, you know, what what is he doing for uh, rest and relaxation? How can he access or find opportunities for for that kind of food uh, sometimes i'm resting too but sometimes not as as much as i learn i'm going out to have a walk or like uh, just going to get the buses because he now gets used to know how to get the buses in the beginning he had really difficult for that uh-huh. but i encourage him too as well just go do it and you call me if you last but now he's doing this stuff by his own which was really happy if he's really feeling frustrated at home he's just going around and coming back uh-huh oh excellent well let him know that I find it confusing taking the buses out there. So he can you can also rent those scooters. A nice tour around uh, the island uh, uh, there is also a wonderful thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Khalid, maybe I'll, you know ask you yourself uh, some of those same uh, some of those same questions um you know what 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 stands out for you as a newcomer to Canada what what helped and, and, and you know maybe what kind of hindered where could you have used some extra support or engagement yeah uh actually so really it was shocking for me in the beginning especially in airport because when the uh, immigrant officer welcomed me, it was something really strange to me, which never had, we did never seen in Australia. And we never seen an immigration office to treat us very nicely. And in that moment, I thought I'm in dream. Mm. I'm at a really dream. And so it's really shocking. But when I get out of that, when he confirmed all of my documents, so I see Iris by herself there in airport, which was really uh, nice welcoming by her staff because not just only her, she was there, her husband and other staff was there. So I shocked more and more. But when I went to community, I see the Canadian really polite and nice people. As a newcomer, they are so far very nice to me, uh, helpful. But as you know, as a newcomer, you have a lot of challenges because you need to learn the new cultures. We need to learn how to communicate with the Canadian as well because they have a different culture, different tone of English, different way of speaking English. So that's going to make it more harder and harder. Uh, the How to get to jobs and how to start to work and how to even go to interviews. Which, uh, I'm not saying my English is very good, but I have something, I know some stuff about English, but I'm still stressing out. When I want to do something, I'm uh, asking my coordinator, this is, this is the way, it's good or not, because mm-hmm. sometimes I'm stressing. So the mm-hmm. lack of knowledge of the culture and the marketing and how we can connect that is really big challenging, especially for seniors, because uh-huh. uh, as is, as he's not the only the one. We had another senior who was really was stressing and he all the time saying, hey, Khalid, you know English. I don't know English. And most of the time he's stressing out. But they don't know I'm stressing out too, even with my age. But mm-hmm. I'm just not showing him. But they have, a, we have a different age. It's more desperate. And sometimes they think, okay, we cannot make it here. 
mm. but this is going for all of us as well but so the ages make it this feeling worse make it more more harder for them i i really love this meeting because i saw you guys really trying here and so as you saw the points and disadvantage or advantage of that i'm sure you're gonna go somewhere is good with that and you're gonna help these people more and more and more because at least the young people we have a uh, we can find our path finally with a nice uh, coordinate and iris i'm telling you she is a, like a mother to us <laughs> uh, she is a, like a mother to us and her staff lovely like her so i'm very sure of that we can do it even for our seniors by help of these nice people but it's difficult so it's really difficult i'm telling you it's very difficult sometimes even i'm scared mm. iris already give me some path show me and which i love it and she talked to me specific about it. But sometimes I'm scared because I'm new here. I don't know that I'm only the one here. I don't have support. Uh, actually, my family is here, but I have only Iris and her stuff, which make me comfort about that. But it's scary. Mm. It's really scary. Mm. I just uh, b before we continue, I just would like to let everyone, all our listeners know that uh, Please, uh, you can start sending in some questions now in the Q&A, and we'll be able to uh, direct those to different panelists. Uh, so please feel free to, uh, to offer any questions that you may have. Um, just continuing on that, on that uh, train of, of thought, Khalid, is you know, how important or has it been available to you to connect with uh, the you know, Iranian community, to speak Farsi, to uh, find some really good rice and kebab. I have a a, a friend, uh, an older Iranian friend that says the best Ira Persian rice in Canada is the worst in Iran. But we still try to do our best because, you know, I know uh, and how important gathering with your community and sharing food together and those kinds of things, as as Kahir was mentioning, uh, as a way of um, uh, affirming that that belonging and participation in the community has that been something accessible to you and have there been channels available to you to to connect with, with like that uh believe me in second week i did that because i, I was 10 years in narrow island i uh, i yeah i cook i'm I, i'm able to cook but sometimes you needed to get it the proper way and in second week really it was a, a nice uh, nice experience one of my friends which is uh, supported by onf too he took me to that places but not really i get to connect with the iranian community yet yeah uh as i'm uh i could be able to commit with the arab people too because i'm iranian mm -hmm. arab and i speak arabic as well oh, okay. so it's for both uh culture i haven't really could connect it yet and I'm really it's hard for me as well to get to those connections so those community and how they making uh, the gathering or celebrating management because I'm not aware of that at all so yeah it's really hard to get to community at the moment for me but yeah if I, you ask me about those nice foods yeah I'm already on it <laughs> I'm already out of here. okay yeah. excellent yeah. I, I wonder just before we shift now to some questions from our uh, from our um, uh, participants today, I wonder, Aziz, um, you know, we all wish and uh, entrust and, and hope that your family will arrive soon here in Canada and we will uh, open our arms and, and welcome them. Um, what what is he going to tell them when they when they arrive? Um, what is he going to? میگه من آرزو میکنم که خانواده به زودی بیاین اینجا و من خودم دوست دارم برم پذیراشون باشم ولی وقتی رسیدن اینجا چی دوست داری بهشون بگی؟ چی چی میخوایی بگیم؟ ما برش فقط امیر را اول میگه که از دولت کانادا تشکر میکنیم که اینا را آوردن برای زنا خوش آمدید میگیم دولت کانادا که he said, first, I will uh, ask them to appreciate you, the Canadian government and Canadian people to give you that opportunity. You are uh, actually fled from that uh, feeling from, uh, sorry, run away from that hell and coming to heaven. So just to remind them, 
and keep them in the mind, just appreciating the Canada and Canadian government. That's the first thing I'm going to tell them. Okay. Which we are really. I'm always uh, appreciative of that too, really, especially for me. Thanks to Iris and the Canadian government, I'm always appreciative of that. I'm trying to do my best to pay back as well. So this is feeling is from us as well, because we were in the 10 years uh, remote islands. We completely forgotten. That's why the operation not forgotten come up and really save us. So I'm always appreciative of that too. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for uh, blessing us and our, our country of Canada by by being here with us, you 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 are bringing far more than we could than we can give give to you. So thank you, Shukran. Uh, thanks, thanks, sir. thanks, sir. thanks for for thank you. Thanks, thanks for And this, uh, thanks to you guys, and thanks for opportunity as well. Well, we we have an opportunity now. We have uh, a few minutes uh, uh, to field some questions for from our uh, participants today, and uh, so please do uh, include those and send those in. Um, there are a couple of here that I see in the uh, chat box. Um, one is, um, are there funding opportunities? to support community organizations for the increases of refugees Canada is expecting to receive with the new federal call. Um, do we have one of our, our panelists that might be able to uh, answer that question? No, okay, well, we'll have to, uh, we will have to uh, look into that to see if we can uh, answer that question. We will we'll include it in our feedback to um, our participants. Um, a, a question here from, a, from, an, from an attendee. Uh, I, I think it is both to you, uh, Aziz Al Khalid. Thank you for sharing your stories of hardship and resiliency. Do you have an idea of one thing that could make your transition easier, what would make the biggest impact? And um, yeah, why don't you go ahead and then maybe? Uh, uh, yeah. I first I translate for it. Minge, agar ye idee dashte bashi ki in halat antaal az un halat ki masala tu uz zindagi budi, baad mein tu uz zindagi jadid. Chhe be nazar kama ki mukhani ke tu stari tar betuni. آداپتی <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, comparing to what I was there before, I like in the community, uh, actually in detention center for such a long time. So it was making much comfort because we lost in such a time, like a decade, actually 10 years, nine years and a half. So the transfer could be just easy to find the job and easy to doing uh, to helping my family to get here for such a long time. I haven't seen them, so that's gonna be one of the best things I can I could do it. Yeah, if you want my opinion too, I could share it with you. Guys please, well. please. Yeah. So uh, because here has a different rules and different standards of the living which is Canada, where they have a different rule. So I'm trying to get at the moment proper training, even for my own career or my job, which has really made it hard for me. It's really at the moment I'm taking such a long time, like one month, just to finding the proper training for my own job or doing my own stuff, or I have to wait in such a long time, two or three months, or maybe I get the right information or, or not. Because when I could do the proper training and I kind of have a proper job so in this community, first I could pay my taxes and pay back for this country, which is very important to me. And I could help my could help my family too. Or Aziz can do the same as well. But still in these three, four months, we are struggling to find the proper training. 
which our coordinator is really doing the nice jobs here and they are doing their best to get us the proper training. But this is one of the main issue we we really facing that. Uh, I see everyone mm. they face this issue as well. Okay, thank you, uh, if, Iris. Yes, please. If you don't mind, I want to elaborate a little on that. So, and see, and and um, how it arrived December twenty twenty three, twenty twenty two, and January twenty twenty three. So. If you think about it, they spent nine and a half years in indefinite detention. They were told they would never ever settle in Australia and would not be welcome anywhere. So for them, as they said, it was a shock to be welcome at the airport. But also what we're finding, um, as we have this very concentrated population living with us and being supported by staff, is the waiting lists that are being encountered in, in Canada, we're used to experiencing waiting lists. We all know what it feels like to wait for a surgery or to wait for services. But it is a shock to them that this exists in Canada. So waiting for link classes. Now they have to wait two months for link classes. So we're doing our best to fill the gaps by creating our own English classes while they have to wait to enter link classes. And while they're waiting, to enter specific uh, job training programs. As you know, none of this is instant and everything has a process to apply for and it takes a few months. But you also see that they want, are ready to go. They wanna contribute to Canadian society so much that uh, they are um, sometimes rushing a little ahead. So we're trying to, um, explain to them how things work and, and that sometimes things are not working as quickly as we have hope. But that, of course, is a barrier to integration and to them moving effectively forward in the first year. And those are challenges faced across the settlement tax sector and across uh, the newcomer populations of accessing the training and the opportunities to be able to join the Canadian job market effectively and um, in, in a contributing manner. But as you can see, these are people who are looking forward to becoming productive Canadians. Thank you. Thank you, Iris. Uh, Barb, would you uh, be able to speak to the funding opportunities? The question again was, are there funding opportunities to support community organizations for the increases of refugees Canada is expecting to receive with the new federal call? Yeah, I, I don't know of any federal government um, uh, new programs uh, that, that would support this, but in every community, there are funding opportunities that this would be a good fit for. Um, there's uh, almost 200 community foundations across the country. So in most communities, um, this is the kind of thing that you could see if your local community foundation um, uh, in their general grants program, uh, this, this could very well be a fit. Service clubs are also really great sources of local support for local community organizations. And again, this is something I've seen many times where, where service clubs, and it might be, you know, the um, uh, uh, university women's club or the local rotary club um, that, that are interested in supporting this kind of project. Uh, many local governments have community service grants. And again, if you're a, a community organization within a, a regional district or a municipality, uh, check to see if your local government has those kinds of grants. And for, for funding opportunities, we're regularly updating um, things that are relevant around uh, healthy aging and aging in place on the uh, Healthy Aging Core Knowledge Hub. Uh, so for the Core Alberta, Core BC and Core Canada uh, and the e-news for, for each of those, we always have a regular section on uh, funding opportunities that we hear about. Um, and so feature them in the e-news and in the, the uh, area on the core websites uh, for funding opportunities. So check all of those out. And if we hear about any new federal funding calls, uh, or even provincial ones, we will get them posted on CORE. Thanks, Barb. 
another question is, and, and I think this is uh, directed to uh, Venke and Iris, is, you know, a lot of our listeners today are work in the community-based senior services sector, uh, agencies or organizations, maybe frontline workers or people working in community, and they they want, we want to help. We want to engage with and support uh, newcomers to Canada. Um, but in, 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 you know, in some ways, you are the experts, you are the ones that are, that is your entire focus and dedication. Um, and these organizations that maybe work with older people, how might they partner with you? Or what, what do you see as, as, as a community-based seniors serving organization? What can they do to help facilitate and support newcomers in their community uh, that arrive on their doorstep or a, a family member knocks on the door looking for something, uh, some service or something for the um, uh, someone in their community, a new person in their community. What opportunities are there to, to, to partner or how can we support your work or engage together? What, maybe Avenka, start with you. Um, so what we would be very excited about is um, if, if they would approach us and we could look at how to um, collaborate on programming. So maybe look at the, uh, the, uh, the daily activities or the, you know, what they're setting up. Could there be one, um, could there be regular activities that are more um, diverse and looking at maybe looking at games or 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 introducing foods and and different things so that it makes it inclusive do they have interpreter services so we can so the so so the clients could have interpretation and also again uh, have it open that it, they also include um, is there space to include the families because often they don't want to go you know they, again depends on the individual elder but often what we hear is that they feel more comfortable if they can bring somebody from their family member and stuff so again and and and, and uh, us to talk about how to to support them in further understanding um, the communities the local communities and stuff so we have done many things like this and we are always very eager and i think in many settlement agencies across canada will be very uh eager to do similar things in in in, in places like halifax or in other not you know maybe a small city but medium-sized city we don't have a big huge community like ethnic communities to to you know so we need to look at the breadth of immigrant populations and how to make 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 the services more and definitely there are clients that would be love to be referred i think yeah thank you venka uh, iris you have something to add uh... yeah I, I would suggest that i would ask any senior serving organization to get in touch with the local settlement agencies in their community to speak to the people who are managing settlement services being provided to newcomers and make those connections to talk about opportunities of information sharing, such as we did today, where people can be invited into those communities to talk about their experiences so people can see what they have in common and not what divides us. So we build those bridges between older Canadians and older newcomers also. And that is probably to me the most important thing I can say to people is make the connections. Don't wait for agencies to reach out to you. They're busy every day, but mm. they certainly welcome the community coming to them and saying, we would like to be engaged. We're looking for opportunities to be engaged with you. How can we move work together? That is probably the biggest thing I, I would suggest that can be done. Thank you. Well, I think uh, everyone, we are we are coming to the end. Uh, we've come to the end of our time together today, and uh, it's just been wonderful. Um, I would just like to make a plug uh, to our on aging uh, biweekly podcast, Canadian Conversations, where we host uh, uh, different leaders on aging 
in Canada uh, this coming week, I believe it's uh, Dr. Samir Sinha that we'll be speaking to. Um, so please do join us for those uh, web podcasts. You can catch them online. They're there in the chat. A real honor and privilege to speak with you, uh, Khalid and Aziz, and we wish you all the best for your families and your uh, uh, your coming to Canada again. You you bring far more to us than than we can ever uh, offer to you. So uh, thank you for, for for being with us and and all of our uh, hosts and guests and panelists. Thank you so much. And and over to you, Barb. I would just like to uh, reiterate my appreciation for for all of our presenters today, and uh, and thank you, uh, Gregor, for for moderating, and thank you, Gemma, for uh, uh, keeping us all um, organized uh, technically on on Zoom. Uh, but in particular, I really want to to thank Aziz and and Halid for uh, sharing your experiences with us today. It's been very moving, and and we really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, to be here and, and talk about um, uh, your experiences of, of uh, coming to Canada. Um, and just a reminder to everyone that the uh, uh, session has been recorded and will be available on CORE um, in the next few days. Uh, look at CORE Canada, CORE BC, and um, uh, you can access it there uh, because we know that many people who signed up weren't actually able to participate uh, today or stay till the very end, uh, but uh, it will be a very useful resource for, for people going forward that we will continue to promote. Uh, so thank you everyone again for uh, presenting and thank you to everybody who participated and, and taking time out of your busy day to uh, be with us and learn with us today. Thanks so much. Uh, we are really grateful to have us and let us to speak out. I'm really grateful for that and I wish you the best. Bye-bye.